Welcome back. So today we are talking about a 50-year span of Greek history. This is known as the High Classical Period. And specifically, we are going to be talking about the Parthenon, which is part of the Acropolis, and how it fits into the High Classical Period. So here is the Acropolis with the Parthenon, the big rectangular building, and the Erechtheon and other little buildings. And in order to discuss why it looks the way it does, we have to talk about the influences or what was going through the minds of the builders and the political leaders at the time. So first of all, the psychological effect of the victory over the Persians gave the Athenians very high self-esteem. This was at Athens at the high point of the Delian League before the Peloponnesian Wars, which were the wars between the powers in the peninsula. Pericles ruled Athens, and he was going for a, a legacy or promotion of Athenian supremacy, or a glorification of Athens as a political power, and a cultural ideal. He ruled according to the principles of justice, equality, opportunity, rule of law, intellectualism, and open society. And according to the Greek historian Thucydides, he says, quote, if Sparta were to be laid waste, its remains would give posterity little impression of its power. But if the same misfortune were to overtake Athens, the power of the city from its visible remains would seem to have been twice as great as it is. And here we are, believing in the enduring legacy of Athens with no mention of the major military superpower of the time, Sparta. So Acropolis means city on top of a hill. And this city center was dedicated to the goddess Athena. And Pericles began the rebuilding of the Acropolis after the Persian troops destroyed it in 480 BCE. So after the Persians were defeated, they were feeling really good about themselves, they decided to rebuild on the same spot. The architect and artist and sculptor, who had a whole workshop, Phidias, uh, supervised the project and it required staggering amounts of labor and cost, and work continued through the 5th century BCE. In addition to the Parthenon, there was the Temple of Athena Nike, which is uh, victorious Athena, and the Erechtheon, which we will also discuss in more detail. It's called the Parthenon because it was dedicated to the goddess Athena Parthenos, who is the warrior maiden, in contrast to Athena Polias, which is the agrarian goddess of the city, who was worshipped in the Erechtheon. So there's like different versions of Athena. And this temple is basically dedicated to her as a warrior. It was built on the foundations of an earlier temple to Athena that was under construction when the Persians sacked Athens. So many blocks were quarried and partially carved, and the architects, Callicrates and Ictinos, or Ictinos, were restricted to the proportions of that earlier temple. They did, however, need to enlarge the base of the temple in the northern part to make room for the enormous cult statue inside. This is a replica of the giant bronze figure of Athena that had a spear tip and a helmet that reflected the sun up to 10 miles away at the port of Piraeus. So Phidias and his workshop were responsible for that giant statue of Athena, and there are some characteristics of art made by Phidias. First of all, there's this Olympianism, which has this, I don't want to call it stoicism, but it's like a cool, calm, sort of in control of your emotions. There's also this idea of platonic forms or the platonic ideals. And this refers to the philosopher Plato, who sort of said that there was a perfect shape, a perfect form, and we weren't ever going to get there, but we had to imagine that I'm doing a bad job of explaining platonic ideal. Basically, it just means like the perfect thing you can think of in your head. The work done by Phidias, the program, subject matter, treatment, it emphasizes the vision of Pericles, where Athens or Greece is this beacon of light. It has simplicity, balance, rationality. However, Phidias was accused of embezzling materials and money so he was exiled from Athens. His career wasn't really destroyed as he later completes another kind of giant statue of Zeus at Olympia. But that was his last big project and he never worked in Athens again. 
Okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of this building and sort of talk about the architecture and the art. So there was kind of like two sets of columns. There was an inner and outer set of columns. And typically the number of columns on a long side is double the number of the short side plus one. So here it's eight in front and 17 on the sides, eight in front and back. And then the inner cella or the room would be mostly for ceremonies and not general use. So I think I'd mentioned it in the last, maybe the Oracle of Delphi lecture, where I said like all of the things would take place in front of the temple. You didn't really go into it. So here's my favorite part of the Parthenon. There were many small adjustments in the Parthenon. Nothing is exactly vertical or horizontal. And because of this, each stone has only one place it belongs. You couldn't mass-produced stones, like the Egyptians would make all these stones the same size and put them on top of each other. They needed to be carved as carefully as a jewel. So this is a lot of work. And the question is, what might explain putting all of this work into it? So there's a few theories. The first one is called the compensation theory. And this is where the stylobate or that top step and other horizontals seem to sag if you don't sort of give a little lift to them. And then the end columns will look too skinny set against the sky if they're not thickened slightly. So they're compensating. The next one is known as the exaggeration theory, which is where the horizontal lines seem slightly bowed up when viewed from below. So perhaps the temple exaggerates these effects to make it seem larger and more substantial than it actually is. The last one is known as the tension theory, and this is where deviations from absolute regularity create a tension in the mind of the viewer between what is seen and what the viewer expects to see. So instead of absolute regularity and geometry, there are these small changes and curves and angles, which serves to keep the viewer interested for longer. This is probably a false choice, and it's just a combination of all three. The style of bait is curved to compensate for sag, the entablature is curved to make it seem bigger. All effects produce a lively and surprising temple rather than a perfectly exact one. The south side of the Parthenon suffered damage during the conflict in 1687, that's common era, between the Ottoman Turks and the, they were in control of Greece at the time and they were fighting against the Venetians. The temple was being used for ammunition storage and during the Venetian bombardment, a cannonball exploded the excess munitions, and it caused a great deal of structural damage to the building. So this thing had been standing for thousands of years, and then the Turks didn't care about it, and they used it as a munitions uh, storage, and then basically destroyed it all. I have this really great video um, in the modules that I want you to watch about the Parthenon and the sculptures and Phidias, but I'm just going to say a few things about it that might be repeated, or it might not be in the video, but I just want to say there's a few interesting things about the frieze, which is the long band um, that runs along the inner wall of the temple. First of all, it's about three and a half feet high. One of my favorite little details is that the relief at the top is actually two inches deeper than at the bottom. This aids in visibility. So um, because it's kind of sticking out of the wall further, it helps you to make sense of it. It's just like in Tasis, it's another sort of device that allows you to make better sense of it. So the frieze itself has stories and images from the Pan-Athenaic Festival and procession that would have taken place every year, but then every four years it was more elaborate and special. And the frieze progresses just as a person in the procession would have progressed around the building. We have seen this before. Something to notice in this frieze is that emotional detachment and idealism are prominent throughout. And this is contrasted by the nervous energy of the animals. Again, there's this theme of order over chaos or civilization over nature. One of my favorite little details is the four cows and the four sheep that are on the north end and the ten cows on the south are meant for sacrifice on the Acropolis. And there's this A-B rhythm of placid and then restive cows. So some are calm and some are putting up a fight. So here we are. We have seen this before. I'm going to ask you in one of the lecture questions to compare these two uh, processions, freezes, uh, 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Hydrea bearers first, and then you can use that information to help answer the question. So here's the story with the scene on the right. Three youths are bearing water jars on their shoulders, and they are followed at the right end by a fourth youth who's reaching down to lift his hydria, or water jug. And then behind him, or kind of next to him, is a flute player who is heading a group of musicians. The first three youths are executed in higher relief than the fourth, which means that they're sticking out a little bit further. And the fourth one is kind of hidden to create depth. Um, and they wear long robes that leave one shoulder and part of the chest bare as they move solemnly towards the left. The uniformity of this scene is broken up by slight variations in the folds of the garment, the positions of the heads, and the youth gestures. So I've just sort of given you a formal analysis, and now what I want you to do is tell me all of the things that you find similar and different about these two. The outer frieze is made up of metopes, and this means these little sort of squares with images inside these three bars, and each side has a different story in the metopes. The east, there's the gods versus the titans. On the south, there's the lapids versus the centaurs. The lapids were a people. The west was the Greeks versus the Amazons, and then the north was the Greeks versus the Trojans. And again, the overall theme of this is the triumph of order over chaos, Greeks over barbarians, west over east, people over monsters, etc. Just like the east and west pediments of Aegina, there is progress within the metopes of the Parthenon itself. So this is two different metopes. You can see uh, the difference between the earlier and the later ones. The later one, it kind of fills the space more naturalistically. There's not the awkward gesture of the earlier one. And then the more progressive later one shows the counteracting forces of Lapith and Centaur and a play of light and shadow, like you get sort of lost in the folds and the shadows from behind them. A lot of what we know about the Parthenon is actually from drawings by a French artist, Jacques Carré, who made 55 drawings of the friezes and pediments in 1674, right before the destruction by the Venetians and the Ottoman Turks. Within the pediments, or the triangular parts of the um, roof, uh, are two different stories. On the east, you've got the birth of Athena, and then on the west, you've got the Athena versus Poseidon. And that's important because the Athenians had this sort of struggle with who would be their patron god. And Poseidon was an easy choice because of their naval prowess, but Athena was the warrior who, in the end, helped them to defeat the Persians. So ultimately, they chose Athena. There are some real artistic leaps that happen in the statuary of the, the Parthenon. One is that realism and then love of the specific begins to take over from abstraction and a sort of embracing of the generic from the archaic period. Another thing is that there are more artists now working and building temples, uh, and so there's like we've already talked about, this sort of competition throughout the peninsula. And that competition led to innovation in all kinds of things, including art. And so here we have an example of how do you reveal and conceal simultaneously? And you get this drapery that is kind of clinging to the body, and it allows for contours and shapes to come through. I want to end on the Erechtheion because it has one of my favorite groups of statues from this whole complex. Uh, the Erechtheion was this strange composite shrine that had multiple functions and it was dedicated to multiple gods. It was really important. It was one of the oldest temples in Athens. It had pools, shafts, skylights, crypts. There was a den for a sacred snake and these were all incorporated into the building. But my favorite bit is the caryatids, and these are the human columns. And there's a story, or there's stories about the caryatids uh, and why they were used as columns. But before we get there, I just want to talk about the hair. So Phidias, the sculptor, 
uh, in his workshop, made the braids of the hair really thick so that they could act as a stronger support system because the neck would have been too thin and the column would have been prone to crumble under the weight. So he devises the strategy of making the hair really wide. Okay, so why use statues of people as columns? So there's two sort of stories. One is they were Spartan slaves, and this would have been the punishment of the women from Carrie, a town near Sparta, who were condemned to slavery after betraying Athens by siding with Persia. So then they would be forced to forever uphold the temple to the god of Athens. And the problem with this theory is that there were Caryatids being used in architecture before the war. The second is that these were priestesses of the Carii, and they, had, they were maidens who carried sacred objects used at feasts of the goddesses Athena and Artemis. And they would perform this sort of ecstatic circular dance, and they would carry on their heads baskets of live reeds as if they were dancing plants. Now, of course, this is where I ask you, what do you think? So in your lecture questions, you'll have a caryatid question as well. <laughs>